Hello, a very warm welcome indeed to St. Hugh's College in the University of Oxford for our virtual core, Leaven Song, beginning fifth week of Trinity term. Today is a very special day in the church known as Pentecost Sunday, which commemorates the very birth of the church in the first century. We've been around for a while. I'll tell you more about that anon. In the meantime, we are so glad that you've joined us. All that you need, you will find on your screen, including any words to follow if you wish to join in, and you're welcome to do that. We start with our traditional greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. We listen now to our opening hymn.
A reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. The coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. Peter addresses the crowd. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today in the United Kingdom, when people apply for a job, many of you will be doing that as you graduate, possibly, from St. Hugh's College, people fill in an anonymous monitoring form designed to ensure equality and diversity. And on this, you will be asked, and people are asked, about their religion, believe it or not, among other things. And one of the predominant answers today is the top answer on the form, which is no religion. And this predominance is growing in places like the United Kingdom, the United States, where I am from, and other regions as well. That sounds negative at first glance on the surface. Someone to say to a religious person, 
I have no religion. But things are not quite so straightforward. The people so answering, studies show, are in fact usually open to religious matters, but are agnostic about the details, the specific beliefs that one would normally feel that one needs to have to become a faith adherent, for example, to become a Christian or a Jewish believer or a Muslim believer. And this actually presents a wonderful opportunity, as a matter of fact, for people like the church, like this college chapel at St. Hugh's College. We have almost an entirely new blank slate, as people are not saying they are atheistic, they make that clear, on which to labor, to consider afresh the meanings of the things that we say we believe. And yet, of course, also there is a certain challenge that can be expressed in thoughts like this, relevant for a day like today, Pentecost Sunday. What is a Pentecost Sunday? And what do I get if I get one? It's not a word we use every day, is it? Pentecost Sunday. Thinking in recent days about the church facing this challenge, when even advertising a service called Pentecost Sunday, I am reminded of something some of you will have heard a couple of years ago, I think three years ago I mentioned it, in a chapel service, of how a friend once suggested to me, very creatively, that church culture can be thought of as being a lot like popular coffee culture. That is, there are so many different coffees to choose from, with so many fancy names, that it takes a kind of indoctrination even to begin to look like one knows what one is ordering in the queue. When people in the queue know the lingo, you know they are in the club. They are an insider. And besides, coffee like tea is an acceptable, mild stimulant. And if you drink it, you can feel as if it is harmless and it gives you a fix that you need to get the task to hand done, like a fine Sunday service as this one. But what is, for example, a flat white? What is a cafe melange? What is a brev? Or for heaven's sakes, there's even something called a carahilo. What is that? Thank you very much. And does anyone really need one? When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place, our reading tells us. We are all together, in a sense, in one place, even at this virtual service, as are lots of churches and chapels on many Sundays throughout the year, every Sunday, really, and other days, including this special day, Pentecost Sunday. But what is, again, a Pentecost Sunday? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? And does anyone really need a Pentecost Sunday? Let me remind you today of what it means and just several quick and easy steps. First, Pentecost, briefly defined, is what the church calls a feast day. It's a celebration of the church worldwide, commemorating the coming of what Christians call the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, upon the first disciples. Fifty days after the resurrection of Jesus, and we get the term Pentecost from this term, or we get this term Pentecost from the fifty days. That is, the birthday of the church occurred fifty days after what Christians say was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the story which we've heard read for us this evening from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, there were present in an upper room of Jerusalem 11 of Jesus' first apostles, his first great followers. And there were about, we are told, 109 others, including many women, among them Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus had told them once at one of their final meals together, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, Jesus continued, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That sounded as strange to them, I assure you, as it sounds to you hearing me tell that story again. It sounds a bit strange to me as well, if that helps you. Pentecost is Greek, indicating 50th, used even by Jews because the Jewish Feast of Weeks, which is a celebration of the harvest of grain, happened 50 days after the Passover. Hence, Pentecost, sometimes called, in fact, Whit Sunday because of the white garments. I'm wearing a sort of a white 
garment that might have been worn by those being baptized early in the church happened during this celebration. We wear a bit of red too. I'm wearing what is called a stole, a red stole. It's a sign of ordination. The church has ordained me to say things like this to you. And it's a visual phenomenon that apparently looked like fire to the first disciples as they gave their account. That's all fine, but what still is a Pentecost Sunday? What does one get if one decides to look into a Pentecost Sunday, and does anybody really need it? Well, Jesus, we are told, told the first disciples, which are his first students, his first followers, several things to think of that they could expect from this Spirit of God. First, they were to understand that the Spirit of God was a gift from God, who had made heaven and earth, they were told, and who had sent Jesus to them. Assuming there to be a God, that sounds good. And the first thing the Spirit does is to call and convince people to follow Jesus in the first place. The word church means the called out ones. You've heard the word church, I've heard it. It simply means the called out ones. And the idea is that God's Spirit, God's invisible presence working in the world, somehow calls us out of the world to follow God. Okay. But does anybody really need the church? I mean, why do we need the church? What good is the church? What good is a chapel at a place like St. Hughes College, which is a part of the church? Many of us, even if we believe, are completely unaware. We totally take for granted. We may have misunderstood. We may have even been lied to in a way concerning what the church, this set of people called out by the Holy Spirit, has given us. I invite you to do some investigating. Look up, you know, we can all Google things on the internet, can't we? Look up what the church has given us for the modern world. You'll find that a healthy percentage of what people come to a large research university, not least Oxford University, to study, including key, even crucial scientific discoveries from physics to astronomy to genetics by people like Isaac Newton, the Augustinian friar Gregor Mendel, who, by the way, this Augustinian Christian friar founded genetics, uh, the famous art and architecture we all adore, hospitals and health healthcare structures like the Royal College of Physicians, even our systems and best places of education, again, like Oxford themselves, all come from the church. What's that you say? I didn't know that. Yes, Oxford University, for instance, was started by Christian religious orders, monks and nuns and friars, who not only sought an education, but they saw it as their mission from God to educate other people like myself and like you as well. Most Oxford colleges, including yours, by the way, including St. Hugh's College, are Christian foundations started by Christians. Holy places then, a place like St. Hugh's College, not an elite place, rather, a holy place. The gift of God himself taking up residence in us is what the Holy Spirit is all about. It was about Jesus telling his first disciples, I'm going away. I'm not going to live forever. I'm going away, but God, my Father, is going to send his Spirit, his presence, to live within you. That's quite an incredible thought. God's Spirit seeks us out in love sets us apart by the Spirit of God to be God's people, calling us from the world, recreating us from within is the idea, giving us something the church calls the fruits of the Spirit of God living in oneself. These are the evidences that one is having God living within one, and these are things like love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, humility, faithfulness, and self-discipline or self-control. The disciples were afraid, you might imagine. I mean, imagine your tutor or your favorite lecturer saying to you, I know you are following what I'm saying to you, you're learning a great deal, but I am going away. You'll be on your own in a way, except God is going to send his spirit to guide you. This is what we are told the first disciples were facing. All of this is why God's Spirit 
works in us and through us. God's Spirit works despite us. I mean, we are all weak, ordinary human beings. We have fears. We have inabilities. We misunderstand things. We have limited knowledge, even at a place like Oxford. People like you and I have a limited knowledge. We even have, for lack of a better word, and all that I've just said can be described by this word, sinfulness, which sounds very negative. You've heard the word sinful. It simply means you aim at a target. It's, an, it's a Greek word, hamartia. You aim at a target and you miss it every time. The idea is that the Spirit of God comes to live within us when we become Christians and helps us to overcome this tendency to make mistakes, to miss the mark by guiding us and giving us strength and encouragement. And so go ahead on this Pentecost Sunday, find a fancy coffee. You can find a fancy tea. I mean, wine works as well. There are lots of types of wine. By any name that will do all of the above. If you find it, please drink it and tell me about it as well. Save a cup for me or a glass for me. Pentecost does sound strange, I grant you, like a cafe, melange, or brev, or for heaven's sake, that other strange word, a carahilo. How strange is that? The Spirit is compared in the scriptures to living waters. And we might even think of the Spirit as a kind of stimulant, stimulating us to follow, to seek out, to live as God leads. One does have to be taught what some strange-sounding churchy words mean. And one can, yes, wonder, does anyone really need any of that? Does anyone really need one of those, like a Pentecost? Enjoy this day with the Pentecost day had come, we are told in the book of Acts, they were all together in one place. This Sunday is Pentecost in the church. We are all together in one place, virtually at least. We have now been reminded again of what Pentecost Sunday is and what it means. And does anyone, does any of us, including you, including me as we live and breathe and do whatever we do, research, write essays, do equations, study, listen, work, Take examinations, imagine that, here in Oxford, in Oxfordshire, do we really need a Pentecost? I'm now even more convinced that I do. I pray that you and I will be reminded today and throughout our lives of this and will feel the same afresh as we all consider in the light of Pentecost, the idea of our possible faith by the work and the Spirit of God. Happy Pentecost. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our fifth Choral Evensong of Trinity Term on this Pentecost Sunday, which I have just explained. Thanks to all who have contributed, including, of course, our choir with Dan Chambers, John T. Watt, Gian Lee, and Taro Kobayashi for the music and the singing to Taro for a prelude, and to Emeritus Senior Organ Scholar Christoph Kolar for a, a postlude, and to Professor Adrian Moore for our reading. We shall have drinks together by Zoom at approximately 7 p.m. British summer time after this service ends, and a link is provided in the comments of the service. Next week we'll be back on Trinity Sunday, that day is known, and we hope that you'll join us then. This next Wednesday, I should mention at 6 p.m., is our Catholic Mass for Trinity Term, 26th of May. I'll be sending an email to all college members about that. Our traditional ending. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.